Hi, and thank you for joining me. My name is Jess, and I'm one of the solicitors at Advocates for Animals, the UK's first animal protection law firm and home to the leading animal law experts in the UK. I'm here today to talk to you about animal welfare laws in the UK and in selected African countries. Animal welfare reform is a long term project and legislation is evolving all the time. Different countries face all sorts of different challenges for different reasons. And while there's still some way to go in virtually every country in the world, um, it's, it is important to recognise the work that has already started in, in Africa in this field. So on, on screen, you should see an outline of the topics I want to speak to you about today. Um, first, we're going to look at some animal protection law in the UK, and then we'll consider the same in Kenya, South Africa and Egypt. I've been slightly limited in my choice of countries because of the unavailability of information, but I hope that this will give you a helpful starting point and some food for thought. Before we jump into today's topic, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of who we are. Please also note that none of what you hear today will be legal advice, but feel free to reach out to us should you need any, and I'll put our contact de uh, details at the, at the end. So Advocates for Animals, we work with a range of clients from NGOs and activists to individuals who just want to ensure justice for animals. Our work with these clients is extremely broad due to the nature of the field, which means we're, we're a bit like um, highly specialised in-house lawyers responding to all of our clients' various needs, from proofing campaign materials through to assessing legal opportunities to meet their campaigning objectives. This can involve pros uh, possible prosecutions, judicial reviews, um, advising on undercover investigations and, and much more. The role that we take on serves the animal protection community because it means that not only are we providing expert legal advice, but we understand the other considerations at play when it comes to our clients activities and their appetite for risk and impact. Some of our recent work includes drafting model legislation for lobbying purposes, including several amendments to the kept animals bill. Proofing campaign materials for defamation and other legal issues following a harrowing undercover investigation on a farm. Advising on the risks attached to an undercover investigation at an animal trade show and advising on um, appropriate ways to gather evidence for potential legal action and um, filing for, for judicial review regarding chickens bred for meat who are bred to reach slaughter weight in a very short 35 days. Along with the, um, the legal work, Advocates for Animals bring many other benefits as a specialist animal law firm. So we're professionalising the animal law field. Um, prior to Advocates for Animals coming along, um, animal law was predominantly a volunteer or pro bono led practice area, and it still is in many countries. The odd lawyer that did practice in the area was largely inaccessible. It's only by establishing animal law as a professional area of law that animals can start to get their legal protections adequately enforced. Now, this is the case in any area of law that affects humans. With humans, it's professional and specialist lawyers you encounter across the board in property, family, criminal, human rights, commercial and other areas, each with their own set of knowledge and skills. And it's an injustice in itself that for so long animals have not had their legal protections covered in the same way. We're also building infrastructure for the practice of animal law. Now, creating illegal practice means um, building, building this infrastructure, which en enables continuous and expert um, services for the animal movement in the years, in years to come. This ensures continued expertise, time, resources and commitment. One thing that we keep hearing from clients is that having an expert law firm on side to respond quickly and decisively has really helped inform decisions and the direction of key campaigns. Um, we are developing expertise in animal law. Now, having a professional area of animal law also means that uh, you know, a high proportion of time is made available to focus solely on the task of upholding animal legal protections, which in turn means an unparalleled depth of knowledge is being accumulated. So um, that's a very brief overview of who we are. 
I'll turn now to the main subject matter I'm here to talk to you about, which is animal welfare law in the UK. So the Animal Welfare Act 2006 is the starting point for legal protection of vertebrate animals in England and Wales. Similar legislation applies in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and there's additional legislation in place which protects animals outside the scope of the Act, including wild animals, animals used in research. Um, but in order to keep things short and concise, um, today I'm just going to be focusing on the Animal Welfare Act 2006. But before we go into that, um, just a bit of history. So in 1822, the UK became the first country in the world to enact a law to protect animals. It offered limited protection to a small number of animals, such as cattle and horses. And before then, there were no laws at all to protect animals. And a person could beat their cow to death simply because he or she belonged to them. But consider this. Today, there is exponentially more suffering caused to animals by human beings than there was in 1822. Attitudes have changed and there may be less domestic cruelty, but technological advances have meant that humans are now able to cause immense suffering to animals in mind-blowing numbers. In factory farms, laboratories, fur farms, just to name a few. For example, an estimated 75 billion land animals, in addition to trillions of aquatic animals, are killed globally every year for meat. So turning back now then to the Animal Welfare Act. Um, this came into force in 2007 and it combined over 20 pieces of legislation and all of the leading case law relating to animal protection dating back 200 years in an attempt to provide comprehensive legislation. Briefly, the aim of the Act is to ensure responsible animal ownership and the prevention of unnecessary suffering by creating a number of criminal offences. So let's have a look at some of those in more detail. <clears throat> so who's protected? First things first, the animals um, protected under the Act very briefly are domestic animals, including farmed animals, or other animals who are under the control of man. So this could include a wild animal which is under the temporary control of a human. And who does the Act apply to? Um, it applies to those who commit cruelty, and it also imposes a duty of care on any person responsible for an animal, or who has an animal in their care, whether on a permanent or a temporary basis. So the, um, the offence of causing unnecessary suffering, um, that could be found in section 4, subsection 1 of the Act, and the wording should be on the screen for you now. Subsection 2 also makes it an offence if a person who's responsible for an animal allows or fails to prevent another person from causing the animal to suffer. But what is suffering? Section 62 defines it as um, physical or mental suffering or related expressions. Now, this is not particularly helpful, however case law gives us a little bit of further guidance. Um, so what constitutes suffering is a question of fact and must be determined by the court in each case. The painless killing of an animal will not necessarily constitute suffering. The fact that an animal suffered for only a short period of time is not relevant to the question of whether they suffered at all. And what kind of suffering is, is necessary or unnecessary? Now, again, there's no clear definition under the legislation, but section 4.3 lists certain considerations and these should be on screen now. Um, the main elements that a court will consider are firstly, whether the suffering was for a legitimate purpose. Secondly, whether the suffering is proportionate to achieve that legitimate aim. And finally, whether the conduct which caused the suffering was that of a reasonably competent and humane person. Some people um, might say that that doesn't go far enough because animals only receive protection so long as it doesn't interfere with their human interest. And inevitably, it's humans, not the animals, who decide whether the human interest is more important than the animals. 
Section 9 of the Animal Welfare Act creates another offence of failing to meet the needs of an animal for which a person is responsible to the extent required by good practice. Subsection 2 sets out the specific requirements which are based on what has become known as the five freedoms. Now these are um, the need for a suitable environment, the need for a suitable diet, the need to be able to exhibit normal behaviour patterns, the need to be housed with or apart from other animals depending on that animal's needs, and the need to be protected from pain, suffering, injury and disease. The Act itself doesn't set out how these duties are to be met, um, but best practice guidance has been set out in additional regulations, um, like the Welfare of Farmed Animals England regulations, and government guidance, such as the Code of Practice for the Welfare of Dogs. When considering whether an offence has been committed, a court would have regard to subsection 3, which suggests that an offence may not be committed where the animal is kept in suboptimal conditions, but for a lawful purpose. Furthermore, subsection 4 makes it clear that the destruction of an animal in an appropriate and humane manner will not constitute an offence under section 9. The, um, the power to prosecute for animal welfare offences is addressed to local authorities. However, this is discretionary and other bodies may also take up a prosecution. In England and Wales, this has historically been the RSPCA. Now, the RSPCA announced plans last year to stop pursuing private prosecutions against animal abusers um, and its role will now most likely be transferred to the Crown Prosecution Service. But one concern is that the Crown Prosecution Service has very limited expertise in prosecuting animal welfare offences because this has historically been carried out by the RSPCA. <clears throat> the impact on the volume and the success of these prosecutions remains to be seen. And in terms of the penalties that a court might hand down, there are a number of possibilities under the Act, including improvement notices requiring the recipient to take certain steps to improve the welfare conditions of animals in their care, imprisonment of up to five years in the most serious cases, um, an unlimited fine, an order depriving the offender of, um, of the abused animal, and an order disqualifying the offender from keeping animals in the future. Moving on then to animal welfare laws in Africa. <clears throat> the, the perception of animal welfare in Africa differs significantly by region and culture, with some states enacting pretty substantive legal protections for animals and others having none at all. For this reason, um, and also because of my specialism in UK animal law, it's quite difficult to give a short summary of the position. Um, and the situation in many African countries is further differentiated from the UK due to a number of factors like cultural and religious traditions, a lack of infrastructure and education, and the presence of more pressing human-centred societal issues. <clears throat> um, but in order to keep things nice and simple, um, I'm going to look in a bit more detail at the position in three African countries um, which have quite different legal protections as they relate to animal suffering, namely Kenya, South Africa and Egypt. In preparing for this talk um, I've relied quite heavily on the fantastic research of World Animal Protection who have produced a really helpful overview of animal welfare laws across the world. Um, I've chosen these countries purely based on the availability of information and to give a kind of um, breadth of, of different levels of protection. World Animal Protection gives, a, um, gives each country a different score for the various aspects of animal protection law, including how well it protects animals in captivity, animals used in farming and wild animals. A is the highest score and G is the lowest. The majority of African countries have no score at all due to the unavailability of information. Um, but what we're going to look at for the remainder of this talk in, is the more, general, um, are the more general laws around animal suffering and how each of these three countries fare in that regard. So first, um, first things first, Kenya, which has been given the respectable score of B. 
And Kenya, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1962 applies to all living vertebrates and prohibits a number of acts which are considered cruel. These include things like beating and terrifying an animal, neglecting to feed or water an animal, or failing to administer veterinary treatment. However, Article 3.4 provides exemptions to, to the Cruel Acts as defined in Article 3.1. Um, and as such, the coursing and hunting of captive animals, the slaughtering, training and performing um, an experiment on an animal, as well as the performance of an operation on an animal is entirely exempt from cruelty considerations. Um, there are various socio-cultural practices in Kenya that also create barriers to improving animal welfare, such as bullfighting, tattooing animals for be beauty, ritual slaughter, um, or the use of animals in political demonstration. While it's, it's really positive to see the Prevention of Cruelty Act pre protects both physical and mental well-being of animals, there's a very long list of exempted practices, which means that there's still some way to go to centre the issue around the animal's welfare as opposed to human interests. <clears throat> so our next country then is South Africa, which has been given a score of C. So section um, 2.1 of the Animal Protection Act 1962 in South Africa sets out a number of cruel acts towards animals which are prohibited. Um, this is a long and detailed list which includes things like terrifying and torturing, unnecessarily underfeeding, poisoning, fighting and abandoning an animal. There's also a general offence of causing unnecessary suffering. Um, there are several bodies um, which have legislative power in relation to um, enforcement of animal welfare legislation. The Societies for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 169 of 1993 grants um, societies or SPCAs the power to institute legal proceedings against animal welfare offenders. And the Livestock Welfare Coordinating Committee has also produced several codes of conduct, for example, in relation to the transportation and slaughter of farmed animals. Um, but a number of these codes are under development and they appear to have been so for a number of years. Um, additionally, these codes are industry regulated, they're voluntary and they're non-binding. Um, so while there are certainly some positives and substantial protections available, there are still hurdles to overcome. For example, it's not clear whether the SPCAs receive any funding or training from the government in order to un undertake the private prosecution work. Section 4 of the Animals Matter Amendment Act number 42 of 1993 provides that funding may be provided but a number of articles and posts online suggest that there are at least some SPC SPCAs which receive no government funding at all. It's also been reported um, per an, uh, World Animal Protection's research that enforcement of animal protection law is ineffective or non-existent and that uh, capacity to investigate animal crime is limited, in part due to a lack of resources, a lack of training and prevailing attitudes. Um, there are additional cultural practices to overcome, for example, ritual animal slaughter, which is central to a number of South African communities. South Africa's constitution states that persons belonging to a cultural, religious or linguistic community may not be denied the right to enjoy their culture, practice their religion and use their language. A statement from the Commission on the Rights of Culture and Religion in 2011 um, that confirmed that communities should continue to slaughter animals in accordance with their religious and cultural practices as required. <clears throat> Finally then, moving on to Egypt, which has been given the score of E. Um, so Article 45 of the Egyptian Constitution 2014 states that the state also commits to the protection of plants, livestock and fisheries, the protection of endangered species and the prevention of cruelty to animals. The Agricultural Law 1966 also forbids cruelty to animals in cases which are determined by the Ministry of Agriculture. 
At the time of writing its report in 2020, wild animal protection could find no, no determination by the minister. Article 355 and 357 of the Egyptian Penal, penal Code include um, criminal penalties for deliberately or poisoning um, certain defined animals, which are um, riding animals, carrying beasts, towing beasts, any other type of livestock or any tame animal. Sadly, there's no legislation that deals with situations of neglect or that impose a positive duty to meet an animal's needs in this regard. Um, <clears throat> so overall, um, the, the framework for legal protection of animals in Egypt is, is imprecise and it protects only limited animals in limited circumstances. Wild animal protection has also found through its research that animal welfare is not regarded by the public as a serious issue, which presents significant barriers to reform, particularly in countries such as Egypt, where there are pressing concerns fa facing humans, such as poverty and human rights issues. While these issues are serious and not to be downplayed at all, um, it is another example of animal suffering being displaced by human interests. <clears throat> So finally then, to, to conclude, um, while, while there are some African countries that have made attempts to protect animals in law, these are often balanced against cultural and religious traditions, a lack of infrastructure and education, and the pres presence of more pressing human-centred societal issues. An additional challenge comes from the lack of information available online about the enforcement of animal laws, where they do exist. For those fighting for better legal protections for animals and laws which centre animal protection on the victims as opposed to the beneficiaries, i.e. the humans, every country in the world still has a long way to go. African countries face some very specific challenges, um, but many other countries have had to overcome ingrained traditions and ways of thinking in order to enact even the most basic animal protection laws. It's, it's important to recognise the important work that's already happening in Africa to improve animal welfare, but many, many people are still pushing for further improvements to be made. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to listen, and if you have any specific legal queries, you should see our contact information on screen now. Um, please do feel free to get in touch, and thanks again.